Thank you very much. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for coming in. I'm, I've been looking forward to being here. And uh, thanks, Frank, for the invitation and for the tour of the campus earlier today. There's some nice modernist buildings on, on here. I'm especially honored to be in, uh, uh, invited by not the architectural program, but the, uh, the landscape architecture and uh, planning uh, department. Um, I, so I, I hope I don't disappoint. <laughs> Um, I remember a few years ago some uh, students would walk by my studio and then ask if that was a planning studio and I said no it's a, it's an architecture studio and they would say well we didn't know architects uh, architecture studios did this and and I thought well I, th I think some of us do um, but uh, some of the problems that we have to deal with go beyond just our, our own discipline and we have to you know spread out um, and while I respect people that specialize, uh, I think that you know the problems we encounter in uh, where design uh, has a role uh, are interdisciplinary. And so uh, I will share some projects uh, in an attempt to illustrate how my thinking, my teaching, and practice uh, has evolved uh, by questioning assumptions uh, about the discipline and the role uh, we play within it. Um, uh, the work. Uh, it's somewhat, uh, or my practice, I, I tend to do a lot of stuff and I'm interested in a lot of things. Um, and so I'm usually engaged uh, at some, in some form uh, in some architectural projects, uh, usually housing or small scale things, competitions, uh, with colleagues, with friends, uh, a little bit of research, uh, and then the teaching. So some of, all of that sort of comes together and informs each other. Uh, in a, typically in a collaborative uh, manner. So, so this is how I met Frank. I mean, we, we collaborate with several uh, uh, professors from landscape architecture. Uh, I think three or four of them over the last few years. And, um, and it's been really um, wonderful. Uh, I, I did like the landscape architecture uh, conference in SILA. Uh, I was telling my friends that it was, uh, <laughs> everybody's really nice and really friendly. And, uh, and, and my, I think in architecture conferences, we, people that know you talk to you. Uh, and, and, uh, and in landscape uh, architecture conference, everybody talks to you, which is really nice. Uh, so that was, uh, I loved it. I think I'm gonna go back next year if, if I get a, uh, accepted to. Um, and so, so we you know, collaborate with, with colleagues, uh, practitioners, different friends that are in practice, um, and most importantly with communities and people that, are, that don't uh, have access or haven't historically had access to, to design. Um, and, um, and, and hopefully empowering people that uh, have not been a part of the, of the conversation in the past. Uh, I'll start with uh, by uh, uh, talking about the place that I grew up in, uh, which is Fort Worth, Texas, uh, and it's the tw uh, second largest city in North Texas, uh, so the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex is the fourth largest metropolitan area in the country. Uh, our school is, uh, our college, uh, College of Architecture, Planning, and Public Affairs, we're the only uh, accredited school of architecture in the in the region uh, of about eight million people. Uh, the only landscape architecture and planning programs in the in the region, and so we we have a pretty big school, uh, and and it's pretty diverse. Uh, we we were looking at some of the numbers yesterday uh, in a meeting with the dean, and about 55 percent of our students are uh, identify as Hispanic or Latino. Uh, and so even though we're in North Texas, we're, we, we have a pretty diverse um, group of, of, of students. And, and all, many of them, as I was, are first generation college students as well, which brings uh, you know, different set of challenges. Um, the north side of Fort Worth is where I grew up, uh, has a strong Hispanic uh, culture. Uh, it's home to the historic stockyards, which was once the economic engine of the city. Historically, the city, uh, the, the river and industry served as the physical barriers of the north side, uh, uh, you know, in, in relation to the rest of the city. Uh, this has contributed to social, cultural, economic uh, isolation that has plagued the neighborhood for, for generations. And so you can see where downtown is. Uh, and, and now, uh, 
there is a project that is happening in the in in Fort Worth. It's a huge project. It's been in the works for about 20 years. It's called Panther Island, uh, and it's um, it's going to uh, attempt to bring 20,000 people to live and work in the uh, in this city center, the, the doubling the size of downtown, which you can see back there. So that's downtown, which is here, uh, Panther Island. What they're doing is they're bypassing. Uh, the river which flows this way and this way and creating a bypass canal uh, to accelerate the flow of, of water and, and prevent future uh, uh, flooding uh, that will be the, you know, the result of, of growing uh, uh, development. Uh, it's also known as the city center flood pro control project so it's really an infrastructure project but by doing this they're going uh, so there's you know they've already built those bridges over dry, water, uh, dry land uh, and just this year, uh, or la last year, uh, the federal government went ahead and uh, approved the funds to complete the, the bypass canal, which is about $500 million of, of federal money that's going to be invested in that. Um, as they do this, uh, they're going to also create other canals, and then basically all this waterfront property is going to, the levees that are there now are going to go away and they're going to redevelop that as waterfront property. So the question, um, the site was chosen uh, because it's centrally located in the heart of Fort Worth uh, and in the center of three major city attractions, the downtown, the stockyards, and the cultural district. So if you've been to Fort Worth, the Kimball, uh, the Modern Art Museum by Tadeo Ando, they are going to be about over here and so it's say the, the stockyards there downtown and here so then this is the center of the city or will be the center of the city and and um, as a way to bring the city together which is uh, doesn't make sense to me right to create an island uh, to connect <laughs> to connect the rest of the city uh, but that's what they're doing so so obviously the the, wa the development that's going to come with that uh, is you know a, a primary driver of this uh, along with um, on the site, there are several things that are uh, important. Uh, mainly, the you know right there uh, was the site of uh, what's still standing, the the uh, headquarters of the KKK, which was built uh, in the 1920s, uh, and is still there. And uh, within you know eyesight of uh, the courthouse, the Tarrant County Courthouse, which is here, Sundance Square, which is the main square of the city. Uh, and uh, stockyards, which is up there. And so this area was really, uh, despite what, what the city sort of you know, tells uh, as the story of, of cowboy, cow town where the West begins, it was really more about industry. So the stockyards were really a place where people came to work, you know, and, and immigrants uh, from all over the world, uh, and, um, and was not a necessarily a pleasant place. place. So the, this was placed there um, in basically to uh, a strategic move to intimidate some of the people that came here, including African Americans, uh, Hispanics, Mexican Americans, uh, Mexicans from Mexico, uh, Catholics, uh, and on and on and on. And um, so um, uh, these photos, uh, they need to be updated but because this bridge is, has been completed. You can see the skyline of Fort Worth. Um, and the courthouse in the background. And then if you look the other way, that would be where the stockyards are. Uh, historically, the, this, this uh, uh, main street, this would look like they had streetcars in the 1930s. Uh, and in the north side is, you know, we kind of remember that that was a place right there where they burned all the cow poop, right? And, and so it was a smelly, dirty place. And it was really placed there in the, uh, in the Hispanic community. Um, and, and this building now is, is still, again, standing there. Uh, immigrant and black workers that came to the stockyards 100 years ago faced intimidation and terror. Today, a group of visionaries and, com and community groups uh, have built a coalition and have acquired the building uh, to create an art center and community healing space in honor of Mr. Fred Rouse, uh, an African-American butcher who was lynched uh, 100 years ago this past December. Um, because he went to work. So the, there was a strike, a labor strike, and, um, and he you know, went to work because he needed money to feed his family, and so he was attacked and, uh, and then eventually uh, lynched. And so they're doing, they're, they've bought the building, which uh, four years ago when we started 
working in this uh, neighborhood, or I started working in this neighborhood uh, with my students, uh, we couldn't imagine that, some, that, that it would happen. Many people were against it for different reasons, right? Like, why would anybody want to go there? Why uh, some people, you know, just still can't imagine that that would be a good thing. But they, they've got, uh, gathered enough support and have enough um, organizations behind it that they were able to purchase the building. Uh, if they hadn't done that, this would essentially become a, a um, you know, one of these Texas donuts, which is, you know, an apartment building on top of a concrete pad. And, um, and it's really on the edge of what will become Panther Island. So it's the gateway to, you know, stockyards and also to, to Panther Island. Um, uh, today, you know, aggressions continue against community uh, the community that lives in the, in the north side, uh, the Stockyards District uh, ex uh, is expanding uh, and continues to encroach into the residential areas of the, of the neighborhood. So you can kind of see here, this, this is the historic Stockyards, uh, but they're growing. There's two new hotels that have been built, a lot of development. And so the, the questions for us have always been, well, what impact are these de large developments going to have on the community that lives uh, adjacent to it, right? So the people on the north side, which is where I grew up. So it, it's people that I care about and friends and parents of people that I, that I know. And, um, and I, I, I say that with, you know, sort of finally accepting the privilege that, that comes with being a faculty member that gets to choose what projects our students get to work on. And for a long time, we were doing projects all over the world, in, in, in Mexico City a lot, because I, I, I love Mexico City. Uh, uh, but at some point, I said, you know what, why don't we look at the problems that we have n uh, in our communities, right, where uh, a lot of the students that uh, take my class, uh, you know, some of them are actually from there, right? Uh, this semester, in fact, there's one student that's in my studio. We're doing a project in Northside, which is a, we're calling an equity master plan, uh, taking into account all the different projects that are happening in Fort Worth, like the Juneteenth Museum, which is happening. Uh, it's going to be built by, uh, uh, it's being designed by the our firm that did the building, the new building across the street. We're not really excited about it, about that. Uh, we're not, <laughs> some of us are not fans. Um, but especially, you know, if uh, I don't have an image of it because I don't want to get sued, but, but uh, if you look at the rendering that came out for that project, they have the skyline of Austin in w when it's in Fort Worth, right? So there's a big problem with, you know, when people that come from other places that get hired because they're a big name architect and they don't understand the place that they're designing for and they don't even take the time to put the right skyline on the <laughs> picture. Uh, and so, so but, but that's happening. So Juneteenth Museum, African American Museum, uh, Fred Rouse a Memorial and muse, uh, Museum. So there's all these things that are happening. Uh, how can we start to, uh, uh, you know, get these uh, organizations and people to talk to each other and think about what could, how these could be organized. Uh, uh, redlining, gerrymandering have left a big mark on the community as it struggles to combat systemic racism. Uh, incentives such as neighborhood empowerment zones, uh, which provide incentives to homeowners and developers to improve individual properties in the neighborhood uh, have not worked. TIF districts, urban village plan, uh, and other uh, incentives have really never uh, taken off in the north side. And I'm not sure if that's a good or a bad thing because uh, some of the other developments where uh, the urban villages that, that did take off, uh, there was an article in the newspaper just last, this weekend, uh, that, uh, you know, people are complaining about traffic and density and all these. And so if what happens when you have so much uh, accelerated development in a community like that, right? What impact will it have on the people that live there? Uh, so with our students, we've tried to reimagine ways in which we, uh, we can infill and densify uh, parts of, of the neighborhood um, in, to find solutions to protect them and that benefit the community. So looking at, at uh, what the, the, the neighborhood uh, housing uh, and uh, uh, lots uh, are and vacant lots and then trying to see what, what opportunities for us to, to intervene uh, or even looking at some of the uh, public space, or not even public space, just creeks that have been abandoned or become dump grounds and, and to reimagine those as places where um, some of the amenities that will go away with the creation of this uh, master, uh, with Panther Island, this big development, uh, 
uh, like the flea market, which is you know something that is useful for the community of, of, of the north side, is going to disappear because that's going to be where one of the rivers and bridges is and development is going to happen. And so then the students and and uh, have uh, you know uh, designed and, and thought about you know bringing some of these things back uh, in in thinking about how some of the amenities that exist like. Uh, the recreation center, which is a public park, uh, Circle Park, uh, some of the mi uh, middle school and elementary schools, which are on a park, uh, Marine Park, which is a big one in, in the community, and then other parks like Rodeo Park here can be connected using underutilized streets, uh, and then also adding additional programs uh, that will benefit the community. Uh, and also at the scale that would benefit the community. So a lot of the things that are happening in, in, uh, the, around the city, and I'm sure it happens everywhere, um, you know, buildings, new buildings are too big. They're not really conducive for uh, small business owners uh, to lease or to, to rent uh, to start a small business instead, because they're too big, they're too expensive. And so when you look at some of the streets in the north side, like uh, the 25th Street here, Azo, it's a vibrant uh, street that has been active and successful for generations. As long as I remember, as a 10-year-old walking through there, there's been restaurants uh, up and down the, that place. And, um, and it continues to be successful. And so if we understand how that works, then we can maybe come up with ideas about how Main Street and some of the other parts of the, of the neighborhood uh, could, could be uh, engaged. Um, and this, uh, so going back to Panther Island uh, and the erasure of, of history in favor of development and growth for the, s growth for the sake of growth. Um, uh, the two circles on the bottom are sites within Panther Island that once were important spaces for, African, for the African-American community. So this and that, uh, which there's no, uh, nothing there that acknowledges that what used to be there. And it's actually two parks, uh, Douglas Park, Frederick Douglas Park, and McGarp Park. Uh, and um, these were places where Juneteenth was celebrated as, uh, in the late 1800s, 1895, uh, and uh, where baseball uh, uh, was played uh, by African Americans in, 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 in those places. And then people from all over, the city, all over the city would come. And the only thing that it says on here about that is, uh, industrial development, the 1922 flood, and other factors led to the demise of the park during the 1920s. Those other factors was the ri were the rise of the KKK, the building of the KKK building down the street, and, and on and on. And so th this is the only thing that's there in, the, in one of the stadiums uh, that's not being used now and will be demolished, I'm sure. Uh, and then a year ago, we went by and then we saw that, right? And, and he said, we, people don't know the history and then really all of this is going to become just uh, mixed use, you know, sort of uh, average retail space and, and apartment buildings, right? And, and, and all of the things that were, that, that history that was there is just going to be gone. And, and so maybe that's why one reason where some of these things should be kept. Um, when I came to this country, I went to Sam Rosen Elementary School, uh, which is named after this guy, uh, and it, he happens to be the the person that developed a lot of this, uh, uh, a lot of the North Side. Uh, he saw an opportunity uh, when he he's an immigrant, uh, he's Jewish, uh, from Russia, who came through Galveston to Texas and uh, was around Dallas for a while, and then eventually went, moved to Fort Worth, had a storefront, and then saw an opportunity that the meat packers might be moving in to, to, to the stockyards, so he bought a bunch of land and then developed it. Um, and so this is, again, happening at the same time that the KKK and all these other things are happening uh, in, in the north side. And so he, he developed this uh, selling houses, selling lots, and... Um, and I, I lived in uh, one of the streets uh, named after, after him, Rosen Street. And, um, and, and so to me, that's, that's uh, super interesting, right? That a person, development has always been a part of the, of the, of the situation in the north side. Um, the, he would give, he, there are churches, there are Baptist churches named after him. Uh, and uh, he had an amusement park that he created that eventually burned down. The uh, uh, last uh, event that they had was a reenactment of a, of a Civil War battle. Uh, and then it, the whole place, so all these things related to, to race and uh, racism are happening in this place. But he's, they continue to develop uh, the land. Um, 
so our studios then look at uh, you know the neighborhood through different lenses uh, and try to understand place you know based on the data uh, environmental conditions physical conditions social conditions economic conditions uh, some of the interesting things that we we found and we had them look at you know like uh, this safety people usually focus on uh, policing or this was about three or four years four years ago and um, and so uh, they were looking at how many, you know, what the crime rate, wa rate was for the different neighborhoods uh, and how they compared to the different uh, uh, parts of the city and also how the cities compare in Texas, a big city, so San, uh, San Antonio, uh, Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, Houston, and, uh, and Austin. And so uh, the ratio of police officers to citizens, we find that Fort Worth is sort of in the middle, but their response rate is really terrible. So. Uh, and this was a couple of years old, so this is probably from 2018. Uh, but it was nine and a half minutes for a priority one call, which is you're getting murdered. It's a nine and a half minutes, and we know that if it's nine and a half minutes, in, in average, that you know the nicer neighborhoods, the, rich, the more wealthy uh, neighborhoods, it's probably a minute or <laughs> or two, and that the other neighborhoods is a lot more, right? And so we say, okay, so what is it about this that that we need to? Uh, can we think about how maybe the, the way that the police beats or how they organize themselves can be rethought? Uh, and then during one of the national night out uh, meetings, we, um, uh, we went out there and then talked to a lot of people and interviewed people. And so our students uh, talked to uh, some of the neighbors of this community led by Arnoldo Hurtado, who's an artist in, from the north side as well. Uh, and he's doing a lot of great things uh, to uh, mobilize his, his neighbors and his community. I've been to meetings with him and, and, his, and where it's a lot of people that are like our parents' age, a bunch of uh, mothers and grandmothers. Uh, and he has them all there listening to all these ideas about what to do in the, in the neighborhood to make it safer and so on. And so we asked the people, well, what, what's the biggest issue, issue here? And then over and over they would say, well, you know, the problem is the police never show up. You know, you call them, there are problems in the community and they, they never come. And then in the same, uh, you know, walk down the street and then you meet the officers who are there to engage with the community. And, you, and same questions. They say, well, actually, the north side is really great now. You know, it used to be really bad, but now it's... So they're saying totally opposite things, despite the uh, fact that, that uh, they're, you know, uh, the, they're, they're together, but they're really not talking to each other. So it, that was uh, where we said, okay, we, we need to get them to really talk, not to just come and, and hang out, but to talk. And so meetings like this... Um, become a p big part of how we work, that where we go and just talk to people, hopefully building long-lasting relationships that, um, that, you know, for me it was easier because, you know, I, I grew up uh, down the street from here, or I live, I live there for a couple of years. I speak the language, so it's easier for me to talk to all the, the parents. Uh, and they accept me. Even one meeting, uh, an aunt of one of my best friends uh, was there, and then she recognized me, and then we just uh, hit it off talking. And, and so it just made it so much easier for us to, to establish some dialogue, right? Uh, so we're looking at, uh, at data and, and information that we find available, uh, and we're going into their communities. But for us, it's also important that, that they come to our space, right? So we're still designers, and, and we believe in the power of design and our discipline and where we're trained, how we're trained to think. Uh, and so we bring them in here uh, so that they see our, our space uh, and they see how we work and they look at some of the things that we're doing. Uh, and then we have pu public gallery, uh, exhibitions where they can hopefully uh, talk to each other. We have professionals, faculty, uh, architects, planners, landscape architects, uh, and just the citizens talking to each other about some of the issues that they've uh, discovered. This is another student project, uh, again, looking at the issue of safety, or this one which we've seen about the connecting the neighborhood and, and filling in uh, uh, using one of the parks. So I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. The, the, the way that... Um, as I was putting this presentation together, it was interesting to think about how, mostly how I s relate to, to the work and how my thinking has evolved. And even this video, which begins uh, over this, you know, the, the central library, or the, the branch library of the Northside, first library that I remember ever going to. And, um, and, you know, but it's always referenced to downtown as a sort of the seat of power. Uh, and, um, and so here we see what the, the neighborhood looks like from, from the sky, and we can see the mature trees. It's really a nice neighborhood the, that maybe just needs to be, uh, needs a little bit of investment. Um, and so we, we, 
you know, we've been thinking about this notion of land uh, and how land um, and the difference between land and ground and what the relationship of building and power structures are within that. And so some of our, my studios have looked at not just the imagery, but also just the, this, you know, idea of how do we shape the land or the ground and who has the right to reshape the ground uh, and for whom, right, and for, for what reasons, right? And so if somebody is going to... Uh, uh, you know, reroute the river, uh, that's a big deal. Uh, and so w some of these things are really, uh, you know, big ideas. Uh, but even if they seem outrageous, you know, we're reshaping the, the, the river uh, just to create more waterfront property. And so these things are happening anyway. And so we're saying, you know, can we think about this as something that's integral to the city and that actually provides some benefits for the community that exists? And then we do, f you know, some design exercises where we think about these uh, ideas of, of reshaping and scraping and, and re do, uh, yeah, designing the ground. Uh, and so th these are some of the things that come out of that. Uh, eventually, this, uh, one of the uh, several studios I've dealt with that uh, KKK building and, and creating these new landscapes, again, referencing still what the uh, power, uh, where the power lies in the city, uh, but then reshaping the ground and developing ideas for either museums or, or for cultural uh, programs. Uh, we exhibit these things uh, in the community, both online and also in, in galleries, uh, for them to have a conversation about the work. Um, Polytechnic Heights is another neighborhood in Fort Worth. It's on the east side. Let me go fast because I have a lot of things to show. Um, and uh, this project was done with Dr. Ju Wan Im, who's a landscape architecture faculty in our, in our college and who uh, Frank uh, saw our presentation. Uh, we were uh, asked to, to um, uh, organize a symposium at our school, so we invited uh, these speakers, Teddy Cruz, Richard Rothstein, A.K. Sandoval, and Zara Zodi. They gave us some money, so we said, well, why don't we go uh, uh, beyond just bringing people in and having a conversation, let's actually come up with a project and do a, a year-long uh, project where we can actually engage in a community that has some need uh, and that uh, where our students can work and then also we can bring in critics and and uh, to have a um, uh, to 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 have some input into the conversation right um, the neighborhood itself is is a transitioning neighborhood it's it used to be a white neighborhood around a private university on the east side of Fort Worth uh, it became a black uh, neighborhood and now it's primarily uh, predominantly Hispanic uh, lower income, underinvested, uh, and somewhat of a decreasing population, although we found out through our research that there's a lot going on there. It's just not the typical type of uh, developments that we would recognize as successful based on what we see in other places, but there are quite a, bi uh, quite a lot of uh, businesses, small businesses that are Hispanic uh, and providing uh, a lot of services to, to people from that community. Um, we uh, partner with uh, uh, a community partner uh, with neighborhood association, neighborhood groups, uh, but also a co uh, community design for worth, which is a not for profit design center. And, and this is why I want to visit the design center that, from here in, in Springfield, uh, hopefully before I leave. Um, and so, so we, you know, we were working with them to try to establish some relationships, hopefully build on the things that, that we have done. But, you know, if for our research also, you know, or my research, I'm, I'm looking at it in terms of, okay, what is the, dif the difference, right, of working in these other communities that, you know, transitioning neighborhood, my colleagues uh, are working in Freedman's towns in, in da around Dallas, uh, and then, or the Hispanic community that I've, I grew up in. And uh, so it, it's, uh, it's, it's, I think going to be great uh, once we have a lot more work to, to look at. Um, so um, I'm actually on the board of Community Design Fort Worth, and I was part of staff as well uh, a few years ago uh, in the design center. So uh, we had a, um, a design process focusing on two aspects. One of is pedagogical intervention, and the other is um, uh, community engagement and partnerships. Uh, unlike a typical project that will last for only one semester, we integrated three classes over uh, two semesters. Uh, you know, academia, we're limited usually by the, the academic calendar. Uh, uh, and so in the fall of 2020 and spring of 2021, we wanted to develop a uh, meaningful relationship with the community that can provide more sustainable supports uh, even after our project was completed. Our, our work was um, 
through an interdisciplinary uh, disciplinary approach, uh, which gave us an opportunity to think about the project from diverse perspectives. Um, we started with an architecture seminar course that I taught um, to have an overall understanding of the community and start building relationships. And then the following semester, uh, the landscape architecture studio taught by Dr. Juwan Im uh, developed uh, a, uh, the, the master plan. Um, and you know, this was the COVID also when, when this started, so it, it became even more, as I'm sure all of you, you know, all of you know. Um, uh, we looked at it from the neighborhood scale all the way to the regional scale uh, and looking at uh, socioeconomic environmental conditions as well as we did on the other uh, projects. Small scale projects to understand details, uh, uh, site context and residents needs. Um, students who participated in the project are shown here. We had 25 students involved in those courses uh, and a couple of GRAs. Um, the, let's see. Uh, the work was conducted in partnership with uh, us representing UTA, Community Design for Worth, and the community stakeholders. Uh, Juwan and I, uh, representing the university, made an effort to be facilitators along with our students to help the community be able to talk about their challenges and, issue a, and, and issues in a safer environment with the goals of using this engagement to reflect and inform the research and the community-based master plan. The master plan idea is it's, it's a little tricky because it's always top-down and so we, we don't like the term but we, we're trying to find better uh, words to, to describe that. Uh, our students uh, develop community-based uh, plan uh, and other site design projects uh, looking at uh, at the community in detail. Uh, the design work directly addressed the ideas that, that, were, that were brought up in, the, in some of these sessions um, where, where the community members came and even helped us fill in some of the history, right? So we read some, some of the books and some of the things that we found uh, in public resources, but then we, they were telling us, no, this is where that happened, filling in all the gaps uh, just from living in, in that community. Uh, the Design Center served as a partner in helping organize some of the community meetings uh, and uh, even doing this uh, mapping website where people were able to go in and, and just uh, give their opinion about different things uh, within the city. Uh, and then some of the other partners here, uh, Texas Wesleyan University, the Fort Worth Justice Center, uh, Fort Worth ISD, the Neighborhood Association, the Middle School, Junior High, uh, and businesses uh, from, the na from the neighborhood. Even the schools, you know, it was interesting to take some of these things to the, to the high schools and the middle schools, uh, especially in, in elementary schools, and then the kids would just, you know, even draw and, and make notes about what they thought needed to happen there. Uh, we shared our work publicly uh, on the symposium uh, and, uh, and through gallery exhibitions in the neighborhood uh, primarily and then uh, also in, in, in other galleries around town. Um, there are also websites uh, showing the work and um, we, we did have challenges, you know, uh, it, as you, all of you I'm sure know, uh, you know, working, we were discussing earlier or uh, about being in community meetings and, the, you know, the, the, the that sometimes you have some uh, people who decide to hijack uh, meetings and, and it could go off. And so, so that's, you know, something that we have to deal with. And, and so learning those lessons about just, you know, speaking quiet and, and listen, uh, and uh, it, it's, it's sometimes tough, but it's, it's necessary uh, if you really want to engage communities meaningfully. Um, housing the Working Class, a project that uh, we've been working on for uh, a, um, a couple of years now, uh, trying to understand the housing situation in our context in DF, DFW. Uh, so uh, Julia Lindgren, who's also an assistant professor of architecture uh, at my school, and then Lizzie McWilly, who is, uh, was the director of urban uh, design at uh, BC Workshop, who is, uh, I think they're known across the country and, and their office is in Dallas, and so they, we have uh, a lot of partnerships with, with them on, on different type of work. Um, and so, what, you know, we're looking at housing because that's a big issue in, in DFW. We are growing tremendously. We, uh, Fort Worth, were, uh, DFW was growing at about 350, 400 persons per, per day, uh, you know, before the pandemic, and it continues. And so there's, the, we have a housing crisis. Uh, housing costs continue to rise, 45% in Dallas in the last three years. Housing stock is decreasing. Uh, the current development uh, 
reinforces market interest and perpetuates segregation. Uh, Dallas has tended to build out and not up, uh, and, and we understand this probably is uh, unsustainable. In 2018, Dallas passed a comprehensive housing policy um, which identified the need for 20,000 uh, units of affordable housing. Uh, this might be a bigger number now, uh, and the city is currently has uh, in the pro uh, is in the process of establishing an economic development corporation, updating this comprehensive uh, land use plan. Um, the question is, how do we leverage this moment where research, policy, and practice come together and, uh, to change uh, our patterns of development? And so. Uh, we know that uh, patterns that exist in the city, uh, we have racial and economic segregation that is dis disproportionate across geographies. Uh, in 2021, the Dallas uh, Colla Collaborative, Coll Collaborative for Equ Equity Development uh, found that the southern region of Dallas, which comprises 64% of the city's total population and is over 75% black or Hispanic, generates only 10% of the city's total uh, property taxes. Uh, these patterns are the result of uh, things like racial uh, finance policy, Jim Crow laws, uh, and restrictive zoning, uh, protecting, uh, preserving single-family neighborhoods, uh, and have had a long-lasting impact on, on the city. If you look at, the, uh, at our land use map today, 75% of Dallas total uh, land area dedicated for housing uh, uh, of which 65% is zoned for single family use. Um, this uh, equates to over 150 square miles uh, or, an area, or an area greater than the size of Atlanta. Um, we're proposing in order to address the, our, uh, this housing challenges, uh, we need to look at our single family neighborhoods and suburban developments uh, for, for solutions. And so, um, we, uh, what are we proposing as a solution? Uh, high opportunity areas uh, with large lots and low rates of vacancy. Uh, in neighborhoods with high rates of vacancy, increasing property values close to the city's core. Uh, and so we're, we're saying a medium density that can be implemented in some of these places. Uh, in order to address uh, development in these neighborhoods, uh, we propose looking at medium density design that can be easily inserted into the fab existing fabric of neighborhoods without changing the overall character of the place. Uh, the benefits of medium density housing includes more housing units in a smaller footprint, uh, which helps alleviate market pressure. It can mean additional income for homeowners um, in the case of accessory dwelling units uh, or duplex uh, that can offset mortgage and uh, property tax co costs. Uh, while modifications to zoning and building code uh, are things we should continue to advocate for, design should try to meet this challenge head on uh, with the development of contextual housing models inspired by historic typologies. Um, the, uh, we propose that medium density housing in Dallas is more of a surgical intervention to single family neighborhoods rather than a drastic alteration of the zoning code. Uh, at the low end of the spectrum, we're proposing a full build out of eight units per acre, uh, or what is already allowed by, allowed by right uh, in our five uh, areas of the city. At the higher end uh, of the spectrum, we're proposing to double the density to 16 units per acre uh, through a mix of housing typologies that can accommodate a range of residents and lifestyles. Um, so opportunity is determined by factors like household income, jobs in the neighborhood, uh, and quality of schools. Uh, high opportunity areas are concentrated in the northern part of the city. Um, economist Rosh Shetty uh, has written extensively about the impact living, uh, of living in high opportunity areas. Uh, every year you spend in a better uh, area during your childhood increases college attendance rates and earnings in adult, uh, adulthood. Um, and underdeveloped land in these neighborhoods which are close to, the, to public transportation, quality schools and job centers is scar uh, scarce. Uh, housing, uh, uh, housing options must uh, increase on developed uh, parcels uh, or more units must be built uh, with land, uh, when land becomes available. Um, neighborhoods with high rates of vacancy are simultaneously seeing increases in property values. Introducing typologies like ADUs or duplexes will offset increasing uh, tax and mortgage uh, 
uh, burdens and increase the number of affordable housing options. In both cases, the scale of new development is easily aligned with the existing form and scale of neighborhoods. Um, other cities are already doing this. Uh, Portland, LA, uh, Minneapolis, uh, Charlottesville, uh, to name a few, they're doing away with uh, uh, single family zoning. Uh, the LA Backyard Home Project uh, worked with uh, residents to make the design and construction of ADUs more accessible to homeowners. If they agree to accept Section 8 vouchers, um, they offer all kinds of incentives and support for owners. Um, so uh, ADUs uh, and just basically doubling or increasing density in single family lots, uh, it's something that we were, we're really interested in. Uh, and again, we can see that these things are already happening. Uh, so we did a studio, a housing studio, uh, I'm going to show just one little quick project on that from one of our students, which looked at how to maintain the scale of the neighborhood uh, uh, and still increase density. So his part T essentially is that, that at the street uh, front, it matches what the scale of the neighborhood is, but then as you go back, then he increases the, the number of units creating these, uh, I think he was doing eight units on, the, on his project. So it looks something like this. Uh, you can kind of see the, the street, the driveway, and he puts the parking on the back of the property and then stacks uh, several, several units. So um, it looks like this on the site plan. You can see the elevations and the, and the drawings there. So it, they, they fit quite nicely into the, well, one of the critics who is an architect and developer said that this thing was ready to go, like we just need to get somebody to get two lots next to each other and then build this out and get, uh, you know, I think he said four, uh, eight units on this. And so this is one of the more successful ones. And again, we still have to deal with the issue of parking. Uh, I think in the studio we said we, if you do one parking per unit, that would be fine. Uh, but he, he was able to, to work that out. Modest scale. Done exhibitions on housing. Um, so th these are now projects that, that we've that I've worked on uh, with some friends and some by with, with some uh, friends clients and friends collaborators and, and other uh, people that practice with us. Uh, very small scale. Uh, we call I call them modest but funky. <laughs> and and I think they're inspired by some of the stuff that you see in the north side. The the, the uh, density already happens there. You know, this is a, a house that I think has one, two, three, and then there's two other doors on the other side. So there's at least four or five front doors to this house, uh, an immigrant community where a lot of people come and live to uh, in the same building. And the scale of them uh, is distributed across the whole neighborhood. We see this is a duplex. That's a duplex across the street from that one. Uh, and then we also see how... Uh, Again, the, the scale of this, you know, small, you know, 1,000 square foot houses is maintained. Sometimes we get to see how some uh, new buildings are, uh, or newer buildings are, are remodeled. Uh, but they're everywhere, these bungalows and craftsman houses that could use some, some help and a lot of duplex. So we started to draw, uh, we picked some of these and wanted to draw them and see what the scale of those were. So there's uh, one of these craftsman houses uh, and then a bunch of shotgun houses. Uh, so Main Street in, in the north side, which see coming this way, um, downtown would be here, stockyards would be up there. Um, this is Main Street. It used to be the dividing line, so it was the racial dividing line. So this side of the street is where Hispanics or minorities could live. So this was the barrio. Uh, and so you see a bunch of shotgun houses, and some of them are gone. So there's one, there's two, a pair of them, there's another one, and they're usually in pairs because they would take a single lot and then splice, uh, split it down the middle uh, and then build two shotguns on there. Not, right now, you can't do that. You know, it's illegal because it's a non-conforming lot. So we're saying, well, why can't you do something that already exists in the neighborhood, right? And it works perfectly fine. And so, so we're trying to, uh, uh, you know, take some of these things and say, okay, how can we, you know, the other half, this one in particular is interesting because it's even owned by the city. Uh, and so no one can really buy it to do anything except the, the person that owns this one, who they were really great. And it's owned by a teacher from uh, the high school, the principal of the high school where we worked at in Poly. And that's how we found out that they own something in Northside. I said, well, we want to draw your house. Um, and really, they're the only ones that can buy that because they're the only ones that can make use of that because it's illegal to actually build on that. So again, we see 
the patterns that we see the, you know, the vacant land and we can say, okay, actually we can accommodate a lot more people if we start looking at some of these beautiful little shotguns and the scale of them, right? Um, and so, so then we, you know, some of these projects are from other places and we say, okay, can we scale these down to f fit or not scale them, but actually just make, design them so that they, they, they fit within these neighborhoods. Uh, and so this takes some of the, uh, the little red barn that I will show here, uh, which we couldn't build in, in the north side. But some of my friends who, uh, you know, have, uh, who are immigrants, but uh, don't have access to a lot of resources, but they're, you know, they're productive, they have businesses and they generate money, decided that they were going to buy some land uh, outside the city because it's easier and maybe they're left alone and they don't have to deal with a lot of things <laughs> that they have to deal with in the city. And so they went outside of the, in the suburbs. And this is what this area used to look like uh, just a few years ago. You can kind of see that these lands were subdivided into one acre lots. Uh, and so then they, they bought one and then another one and then another one. So we're doing three houses. We've done two. This one's under construction. Uh, this one we call the Red Barn House, and we say, oh, we, we're going to make it small because these, to me, they're always prototypes for how can we, f what can we learn from these projects that we can then uh, use in, uh, in the city, right, to help uh, alleviate some of these housing problems and costs that we have. Um, and so the first one was this, uh, we'll call it Barn House, which is a basic part, a simple part T. Uh, we thought, for me, I love Lou Khan. I live or, you know, in Arlington, which is Dallas-Fort Worth, the Kimball is there. So we, you know, we, our school, it's, you know, Khan is like a god. <laughs> so, so we, so, you know, Khan said, you know, the, the cities are places of, of availabilities. It's where a child might discover what he wants to do with his life. So to, in my mind, I've always been, you know, I was trained to think that way. And so I love cities. I'm also, you know, I'm a Latino in, in, in Texas. And so typically we're, some of us have not had the most pleasant encounters outside of the city. And so we try to stay away from them. So we said, what do we do when we go outside of the city? And so we thought, well, maybe you, there's no urban life. So you, you uh, connect with the landscape and you connect with the, with the sky. So that's the basic part, T. And we said, so maybe it's about looking at, at the sky. And so we developed this idea. Uh, my friend said, can we do something that's maybe about the cost of a double wide trailer, which is what they were going to put on there? And I said, well, I don't know. We can try, you know, and we'll see what happens. And so it was more than that, but it was still very cheap. We built this um, for about, with all the mistakes, because he contracted it out himself, uh, and we were, <laughs> and that takes longer. And he paid for it, they paid for it, his family, his wife and him, uh, with the money that they were earning every, with, through their business. So it took a couple of years to build, but they were, they had no debt. You know, there was no mortgage, there was no, they just paid for it. They saved 7,000 bucks, foundation. Another $10,000, framing. Another ten thousand uh, dollars, cladding, and so it took two years. But every time that they had, they, they were able to build it. And so the, that's the the, the house is basically a, a shotgun. Not perf doesn't perform like a shotgun, but it's at least a, the it's a long linear house. Uh, and then also maybe because of all the motorcycle rides that we take in the in the rural areas of Texas, it, it looks like a lot of the barns you see across Texas. Um, and so here's a basic plan, living area. Uh, uh, kitchen, and then we just, I just said, look, you can use cheap glass, I don't care what it is, as long as it's all glass. So we want to be able to connect to the, to the landscape uh, here, and then in the master bedroom, uh, we, they sacrificed one shower to have a washer dryer, uh, but it's, it's got everything they need. This is uh, me looking at the house and a horse looking at me. Uh, and that's when it was under construction. And that's what it looks like, and it's, it's a simple metal building. It looked like this, you know, after one year, but it was just gutted on the inside, right, until they got enough money to do insulation and then uh, jib board and, and on and on. Um, and uh, th I love this picture because that's basically the party, right? So it's, it's the framing and the floor and the, and the connection to the sky, uh, and the interior has this volume of space uh, that, that uh, has beautiful light. Uh, and it looks like that. And we say, but it's basically a shotgun. This fits next door to that other shotgun in, the, in Fort Worth. Um, and then so we did another one, this one with Don Gatsky, uh, who uh, we were talking about earlier, who is my mentor and friend. Uh, and so this is in, in Dallas, uh, in the Cedars, just south of I-30 across the freeway from downtown. And so this one, it's in front of two shotguns, which I hope I have the picture of. 
Yeah, uh, so this is from the second bedroom, has an ADU, uh, or a second bedroom with a separate door. So the family uh, retirees, we designed it, they built it, we put a separate door for the second floor room, which they r rented as an Airbnb. Um, this must have been six, five, six years ago. And they were generating about $2,500 a month, just an Airbnb by leasing it 25 days a, a month. And it was basically paying for the mortgage, so they had no mortgage. And it's, you know, again, the scale of it, which we really uh, uh, are proud of, you know, across the street from two of those shotguns. So we're saying there's something about the scale that you can maintain the, uh, the, the qualities of the neighborhood without changing. Things. And then this one in the same neighborhood, it was an inherited project, we, they had a master plan, but it's an interesting idea. Two of the houses on the back are attached and two on the front are attached. And so we designed these four, actually, I'm only showing the two here uh, because uh, I'm trying to prove a point <laughs> about this single family detached houses that, uh, that we, we can't let go of. And so this is what the, uh, this is for a developer. So we said, okay, how can we uh, do something uh, that uh, takes advantage of the views uh, towards downtown, which is just over, over here. Uh, and then this house actually has a roof deck as well, which has views towards downtown here. And this one has a master bedroom on the third floor that goes out. So this is a 1,350 square foot house on three floors with a one car garage, which we can't give up in Texas, and then the living room and, and, uh, and um, master on the top. So there's the ground floor plan. You drive underneath the first unit from the street. You go in there, uh, and then there's, a, again, the second bedroom is on the ground floor. So if they decide to lease it as a Airbnb, so it has its own separate door. This is the front door to the house. And then uh, the living area would be above that. And, and so you get three units, and these are two lots side by side. So we actually designed these four. You get six units in, on two lots, or three units in one. Um, this is the floor plan, so again, guest bedroom or Airbnb, uh, living room with a deck over the area of the, of the garage, and then the master bedroom on the top, which uh, the, he had a buyer for this one, the developer did. So the, uh, she said, you know, I just want to play. She was a police officer. We said, oh, great, you know, police officer. We want to design for people that are middle class, working class, you know, teachers, police. And, and so they, she said, I just want to come, come home and have a cup of wine. And it's like, oh, great. So let's design a nice deck out there. But really, it was because, I mean, that's part of the reason. But the other reason is that it's developer driven. So the guy is going to sell her this for a certain amount of money based on the square footage. And he said 1,300 and whatever square feet uh, uh, for this price. And so we, you know, which to me makes no sense because. But it made the project bigger uh, because then we had to reduce square footage, uh, but the building is still the same. You know, we didn't, uh, you know, the box, uh, when you look at it from the outside, is the same. Uh, we, I didn't, you know, it doesn't cut that back. I really wanted this little simple box uh, on the top to view, and it's sort, it's sort of that. And, and so this is exterior space, and then this one eventually they closed because they realize, oh, we're already paying for this, so we just put a window there, and then it's interior space. Um, and so the, the master bedroom has that uh, the little deck on the top, uh, and which I, I, it's my favorite space. And from there, you actually have a beautiful view of, of downtown, um, really close. Uh, and and it, 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 again, it, it's because it's developer doing it. And the other thing was uh, uh, square footage and fire code, right? So you know, if you have these two buildings on the same property, you can only go... 20 feet before you can put a window, right? And there's, there are percentages and there's all these codes about how much uh, uh, fenestration you can have. And so we were basically, where that window inside of there is to the next house is 20 feet. Uh, and that's what we could get away with. So it was basically a way around code. But we try to keep uh, the space and the, and the form of the building the way we had it. So there's the front door. Uh, I hate that they put a palm tree there. Uh, <laughs> I said, this is Texas, we don't, uh, but you know. It was the, 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 this is the view from that third floor. Uh, and this is, so this is that house, and the, this is the house that somebody else designed. Uh, and then the, the uh, so then uh, the, back to Terrell where that red barn was. ADUs, okay, so how can we uh, take something that all of single family lots already have, which is the, you know, they, they have typically a two-car garage, whether it's detached on the back if it's an older neighborhood or, or somewhere in the house. And so a, a two-car garage is 24 feet by 24 feet, more or less. So, so we said, my friend said, hey, we want to do this. We want less space, and we want just a little simpler life. And it's a husband, wife, and a kid, uh, 
10-year-old now, 11-year-old. Uh, we designed it in like two weeks or three. We said, oh, let's just do something simple. Let's do a cube uh, with a post and beam, and we just have floating spaces that you can use for whatever, and maybe one is a sleeping area, one's an office, and it's just uh, one box, you know. So we live in boxes, and that's the party, essentially. And then we put all the machines, you know, so like the order of machines uh, uh, in, in the box, and, and, and then we clad it in something cheap. Uh, he built this for 100,000 bucks in two years ago. So we, we're really uh, happy about that. And we say, okay, can this, it's a two-car garage. This fits on the backyard of any single family lot across North Texas and maybe the whole country. Um, there's the plan. Uh, so it's just a post and bean because that was the idea that some of these things could move. Eventually, they decided to just put everything in jib board. Uh, but, it, but, you know, it's, it, they did get greedy. They got two bathrooms on this one. It is a very small footprint, 24 foot by 24 foot by 24 feet. Um, and it's got, you know, so area there that could be sleeping area, uh, and then the real sleeping area for the, for the husband wife is here, overlooking this double height space. And that's the other thing, you know, if two, uh, garage apartments, right, they become really, you know, short and dark and not, not really interesting. So how do you make something spatial about, uh, you know, with a, such a small footprint? And so that, that's the house that we saw in the Cedars in Dallas. Uh, three stories, 1,350 square feet. This is a 24 by 24 foot cube, and that's the, so you, you can kind of see how, how small they are. They feel bigger when you're there. Uh, that's the owner. So uh, we do like to talk about this as being a project that's 100% Latino. It's, uh, every single person that worked on his was, is a Latino from every construction worker to the client and to myself as a, as, as a designer of, of the of the, of the house. Uh, and then we were more interested in lights uh, and how the light would move around the space on this one. There's a cube, it's nothing, it's just metal, it's pr pretty simple. Um, and then there's the, so from the second floor, again, you see the space, the skylight up there, and then the big window uh, towards the south. Uh, and so we were really happy with some of those effects. It, it, the, it doesn't look as good here, but it, it is actually that blue, and to see, you know, the, uh, the afternoon sunset on the wall that's coming from that window to the other window there, and then the sky above. It's just so, so beautiful, and uh, it's sort of expected, but it's never, uh, uh, I mean, it's always better than you, than you think. Uh, and then this is a photograph looking straight up. So it, again, the space becomes this uh, thing that the, the family can be in and, and just, you know, be there, which is nice. One of the things that the owner said, was that you know that one, uh, built it for a hundred thousand bucks, which we uh, and we were, I'm still so amazed by that <laughs> because construction costs in DFW right now are, you know, for a residential three hundred, three hundred fifty, four hundred dollars square foot for you know cheap, and um, and so he said you know that he, when the, when I asked him what how they felt in the house about uh, six months after, he said um, that he never imagined that he would come out of the house to go look at the stars, right? And we, uh, because he says, you know, I never really care about art or anything like that, but that the house somehow makes them uh, more aware of what's happening around them. Uh, and that, uh, that that's what the power of design can do. And I just thought, oh, this is great, because that's really what we wanted. Uh, uh, so it's like the biggest compliment for us. And it's a house, you know, it's got a kitchen, it's got, you know, it's got all the stuff that they need. It's got a washer and dryer. Simple cube. So then we thought, okay, so how many of these can we actually fit in a property, right? So uh, some, if, if we have properties that may have zero lot lines, and we begin to densify some of these, uh, could, they, could we do two of these on the back of one of these uh, houses? And then uh, they're 24 feet, so if we, maybe we get uh, rid of the uh, uh, windows on the, on the firewall, um, then maybe we can start to, to propose these as, as two or three, two units. Uh, in addition to the main house of a, of a again, typical single family lot. So that's what it begins to look like. Uh, so those are those, those houses. Um, and then I want to talk a little bit about public space. I know we're, I need to finish fast, um, almost done. Fort Worth is tricky. Uh, you know, the way that we think about public space, this is a house that has, a, uh, it's hard to see here, but it's got some signs that say, st stay off the grass in a pretty busy street in uh, on the, one of the wealthier parts of Fort Worth. Um, and then this is the stockyards, and this is during the pandemic. And th so public space and sidewalks and streets are, you know, being uh, 
uh, uh, they're, they're sort of violent. Uh, the way that uh, a, prop, a property owner would ask people to not walk on their grass and force them on the street, a busy street, to walk on the street and, and possibly get killed, to me it just seems outrageous. But everybody sort of drives by it like if nothing, nothing's happening. Uh, even public spaces like uh, Sundance Square in, this, in the center of downtown uh, that are private public uh, developments, this is basically a private space. Uh, and you realize it whenever uh, people want to use it as public space. Uh, so right now, this is at the beginning when it opened, you can't do that anymore because it's private space and I think the, the developers, the owners, don't want to get sued, so then you can't get wet in it anymore. So it's got this kiddie pool playground, but you can't use it. Uh, when the women's march uh, marches were organized around the country a few years ago, they couldn't go through here because this is private space even though the city gave up Main Street to create this. So they gave up a section of the city, a public space, uh, to these developers, uh, private money, and now people can walk through it and you can protest in it, right? So, because it's private. Um, this is the sign that you saw during the pandemic. You can go into that space anymore because they remind you that, uh, please be advised, this is private property. Right? But it looks public, it feels public, and, but it's not, right? And so we did this competition uh, in a park that is the last remnants of the natural prairie that's in, in our region. Uh, and so we thought, oh, this is great, they want to do a pavilion. They actually wanted it to be here. And when we, Don Gatsky and I, visited the site, uh, we said, we don't want to. <laughs> That's not where it should go. Like, that's the wrong place for it. So immediately we said, no, we're going to do something else. Uh, and so we, said, we proposed something that would stretch uh, deep into the park to really bring people in and just appreciate all the natural grasses and all the, 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 the park itself. And so this is the party. And we said, no, not in the circle, but something that stretches all the way over there. And as I've been looking and thinking about this, you know, it, it reminds me that you know, my, my frame of reference is always sort of the seat of power, that downtown uh, is where you know, we should be looking at as sort of as uh, inspiration for where we want to be, uh, when really we should be looking at the park and the things that are there, uh, or our own communities. But anyway, so that was the party. We were inspired by, you know, just TP construction uh, and, uh, and then sim simple lines. Uh, this is what, what it eventually looked like. We, we were fortunate we won. Uh, it hasn't been built yet. They're trying to get funds uh, to build it. Uh, but it's that. And it's, again, this is, it was just to create a place where people could come and sit and then enjoy the, the park. Um, to me, it was more of about an inv inv invitation to bring people from the neighborhood into that park. But this is the, one of the drawings that we were thinking about. They said, you know, when we went, they said, oh, there's downtown. It's beautiful. That's what people should do. And, and, and now I said, no, actually, no, it should be about this. Uh, and so th this is how uh, this issue of equity. And uh, uh, I was really impressed by the, the, the organization that's doing this, that, the, the, that takes care of the park. Uh, because we said, you know, to save some money, came back really expensive, more than they, could, they, they have or they could fundraise. Uh, and so we said, we, maybe we could do it wood, right? They said, no, it's city, park, so it's got to be able to sustain like an atomic bomb. Apparently, with people think that people will destroy things, and, and to us it's kind of silly, but that's, that's the city, right? So we said, well, can we use, <laughs> we're in Texas, a lot of natural gas, and so we said, can we use some of these uh, pipes from uh, the oil, the uh, gas uh, rigs, and so on? And they immediately said, no, because those are the people that we, we, the, who are destroying our, and, uh, on principle, they, and I was like, okay, we, will, no, we won't. So now we're still fundraising, but I, I, I thought, oh, yeah, you know, they, they're right. Like, we shouldn't be using these um, uh, companies and their money uh, so that they feel good for doing some good for the, the community when they're actually doing a lot more harm than, than, they, uh, than they're providing good. And so, so then I, I was very fortunate to get this grant from uh, New York AIA. Uh, to do a traveling, uh, it's a traveling fellowship. And my, my proposal is on Mayan and Garifuna uh, coastline, which is really, my, my friends think I'm, uh, that it's so great uh, and uh, that I was kind of, I think it's a joke that, you know, that basically I got a grant to go look at great architecture and to go hang out in the beach, right? Like <laughs> along the, and it's kind of true, but it's, it's also trying to understand where some of, us who are now building out, you know, a lot of a big chunk of the country, uh, North Texas was built by Latino labor, 
uh, and people that come from the Yucatan and people that come from Southern Mexico and people that come from Central America. My family comes from Central America. I come from Central America. And so how do we trace back our roots and, uh, uh, and understand how, you know, what's happening over there, but also how we bring some of those uh, customs, cultures, heritage into our communities here in the States. And the Garifuna are the Afro-descendants uh, in Honduras. They actually came from another island, St. Vincent in the Caribbean, uh, and they arrived in uh, the Bay Islands of Honduras in 1798. Uh, and I wanted to, it was interesting because I said, you know, there are more Garifuna people in New York City than there are in Honduras, about 200,000 which is crazy. So we, I got to travel to a bunch of Mayan ruins and it was fantastic, it was amazing. That's what I did this summer. Uh, it was really nice to disconnect. And then here it becomes really clear uh, what some of these issues and how we uh, are, uh, how we, uh, and some of the things that we do in this country and our, that our country does uh, have an impact in other places. So this is in one of the islands. This is a Cayo or a Key uh, in, uh, in, in off the coast of Honduras, we were going there uh, because this is uh, it was a private island that it was illegally purchased and sold by the government apparently to I think an American uh, uh, from the U.S. and uh, and it became a private island. When the tide is low, you can actually walk across these two on 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 you know on dry land. And so we were going here, which is a bil uh, an island that is maybe a little bit bigger than this building. Uh, about 20-something people live there, and we had the most amazing food. Um, and, and to see that somebody would build a mansion next to that where these people don't, they don't even have electricity, right? The, and it's, um, it's, it's, it's incredible uh, you know, the, the, how these things are juxtaposed next to each other. So this is what it looked like. We also went to the first uh, settlement, which is on Roatan Island. So if you've ever been on the, one of those cruises, they actually go to Roatan and they take you to this beautiful beach. Uh, so that's where the first land is. So the first settlement of Garifuna people is on that island. We went to visit them and it was amazing. Uh, and so we, with the goal that we want to go back and say, okay, how can we engage? And that we met so many other Hondureños or people like me that, that are now going back and say, okay, what can we do for our communities? People that, that their families are still there. So the, there's a community Community center um, that was started by a, a, a two sisters from from Brooklyn, from New York. That you know now they're in their 20s or 30s, and they said, you know, we're going to move back. Or they actually weren't born there; their parents are from there. But they wanted to trace back their roots and learn the language, and so they went and started a community center. And so this is, you know, uh, I think where where we um, I want to be because I I'm interested in understanding our culture and, and our roots. So inside of that island, this is the the, the elementary school. Uh, which has been closed for a while, and so, so there's the so you know again, this is the main street of that island. It's about the size of this building, uh, and obviously somebody designed this facade for this, but it's been. Can we turn up the volume? So the, the school has been closed, and they have this mansion, you know, a few hundred feet away that was built. It's like, I mean, how, how uh, in your face, right, that we, the, 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 they would do that. That's, it's crazy. Uh, and so it was locked. <laughs> this was kind of funny. Uh, so so he, he says, no, no, I got the key. <laughs> so he goes and grabs the key. <laughs> so we said, wait, wait, you, you, you shouldn't do that, right? So he's saying, I have the key. So we, <laughs> this I'm getting nervous. So he says, so we can get in trouble. He goes, no, 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 with no one. I'm part of this community. This is my home. You know, this is my, so he, so he, and everybody that's there just kind of, and, um, and so he, let me go back. Sorry. I want to see the... So, so that's what the... So then immediately I'm thinking, oh, this is a design-build project, you know, we need to figure out how to get some help, some funds, and... Because now the ki children of this community have to go to another island in, the, in one of the big islands to go to school, uh, and most of them are really not going. Yeah. 
So you have like 60 kids that will come to the school from all the different islands and the other communities. And so, and it, now it's empty, right? So, so how can we um, uh, start doing some of the things that we're doing here in, in, in our uh, local context in, in DFW and bringing that to, to other places, especially I think in a small scale, things that are at the scale mm -hmm. of, uh, um, of, of, of buildings that could be built by, by a couple of people, really. If you get a chance to go to Tikal, go to Tikal. Uh, Tikal is amazing, uh, and it's much different than um, all the other Mayan ruins. The, we went to Chichen Itza. Anybody been to Chichen Itza? The problem with Chichen Itza is that it, it's, there's like a billion tourists, and so they've developed the, the, you know, the tourist pipeline in Mexico to a point that it's, it's almost uncomfortable to be there. And in, in Tikal, you're there by yourself, uh, almost. It's beautiful. So I'll end with the uh, exhibition. So a lot of the work that we do, we, we want to exhibit it. We were, as uh, 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 it was mentioned, that we, we had a, a, an exhibit at the Venice Biennale on watershed urbanism. And so some of our work, especially with the north side and the bypass canal, Panther Island, was exhibited there. And we were, all, you know, as architecture faculty and, and the architecture community, we were, oh, yes, Venice Biennale, we want to go. It's going to be awesome. Uh, great. Uh, then the pandemic happened, and so then it got pushed back a year. I think I was the only one, maybe two other people, one other person got to go. Uh, and I got to go because I was also going to be in charge of doing the local exhibitions, which, frankly, are much more important than the one in the Venice Biennale, because the resources that go to do uh, an exhibition in Venice are extremely expensive. We could build like four cubes of the ones that I just showed with, with what we, or three of them, or I mean a, lot, a few of them, with the money that was spent on doing some of this stuff. So, so then really the local exhibitions become uh, the more important ones because that's where the community that, that is a part of, the, of, of these projects uh, gets to see uh, what's happening. And so we, we tend to do a lot of those. When, every time we have a project, uh, we also do, um, so we had an exhibition on housing in 2018, 19 in the north side. Uh, we have the websites, uh, the housing exhibition from the last housing studio studio from last fall uh, in Dallas uh, where we had, you know, commissioners and people from the city come and have a conversation, ask tough questions uh, to, to the students and to us. Uh, and just, uh, we also do Latinos in Architecture exhibitions where we be, uh, celebrate uh, and acknowledge some of the contributions of Latino designers in the profession. Uh, and we've been around for since 2010, so now we're on 12 years uh, and growing. Our first student chapter just organized itself in, uh, in our college, in our school, at UTA, and we're really proud of them. Uh, and, and we have a competition, a juried exhibition every year, and then we exhibit that in different um, venues. Uh, and then they get awards, uh, and we show them all over the place. And those are important because it, one of the things about to me, uh, representation and, uh, and maybe the privilege of getting a mic. And before, so I know some of you are forced to be here because you have a class, but, but to be given an opportunity to speak uh, is, is important. And, to, and there are a lot of people that have uh, uh, important things to say. Um, and so, so I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. And I would just uh, say that uh, uh, besides thank you, that if you want other people that represent some level of diversity and, and a different thinking, uh, let me know. We have a bunch of them, a bunch of my friends that, can, that are much better speakers than I am and that can, um, can uh, contribute to the conversation. So uh, ultimately, you know, the exhibitions serve as a way of outreach. Uh, thank you very much. Well. I'll take any questions. <laughs>